I'm recording this. Okay. So today we're going to talk about these two papers on Tev protease. Uh, so the first one, I, I think it's the original Tev protease, release of proteins and peptides from, a few, from fusion proteins using recombinant virus plant proteinase. Uh, it's definitely a mouthful. Okay, so, okay, Tev, yeah, I'll get a better one. What was the, what, what is the Tev protease? What does this stand for? Yeah, so this is the tobacco edge virus. Okay, so first question is, um, what's a proteinase? Like, let's make sure we understand the title. What's a proteinase? Yeah, this is no different, that we covered this last time, this is no different than the protease. So proteinase is a protein that finds other proteins and cuts them, cleaves them. That's a proteinase. Okay, so the next question is, why would a virus have a proteinase? What do you think? Take some guesses. Probably when trying to imitate like different things, you're able to probably eat um, that's 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 a good hypothesis. Often that that can be the case. So a virus might encode uh, a proteinase, a protease, to cut host proteins, and by doing that, you might be able to like hijack certain parts of the cell. Like if it was highly specific, it might tar have some target. This is a good. We're just kind of like collecting thoughts here. That's a good. That's a good thought. That's correct. Why else do viruses perhaps encode proteases? Think of any other reasons? So sometimes, um, sometimes virus genomes are encoded in essentially like one long or, and sometimes this is called a polypeptide. So not all viruses, but some viruses, some viruses genome looks like this, where there's a promoter, and inside this, it's just like a giant fusion of like separate proteins. So imagine this was a virus that encoded four proteins, A, B, C, and D, in a single ORF, a single open reading frame. And sometimes one of these is a protease. This is just a theoretical example. And then when these, when this thing gets translated by a ribosome, it'll make some giant protein, right? And let's say this, this part of the protein is A, this part of the protein is B, C, D. And the virus wants these proteins to get cut apart so that they can be like separate. And so sometimes the protease will come back on itself and it might cut here and here and here. And now all of a sudden you have four separate proteins that are able to kind of like go do their thing. So oftentimes a, a virus protease encodes what you might call like self-cleaving or sometimes this is like a, called a maturing function. Function, maturing. Like it's taking this peptide or this big protein and it's maturing it to its final form. So that's another reason why uh, viruses sometimes encode proteases. Uh, and there's another one. Any other, can you think of one final one? Oh, one final thought. Um, just had it. Oh, sometimes some proteins are encoded in like a pro, or like a, what would you call this, like a pro-inactive form. So you might have some protein like X, and this protein X, once it's made, is inactive. And there might be some like programming reason that you don't want X to be active right away. And then the virus might encode some peptide A's or protein A's or protease Y, which comes back to this, this protein X, and maybe cuts off a little piece of it and converts it to like its active form. So oftentimes in the circuitry of like organisms, there's what are called proenzymes, which are enzymes that are made, but they're not ready to be activated. And then a, a peptide A's can activate them. 
Okay, so these are essentially like reasons, some reasons why a virus would encode a protease. Okay, did anybody read the papers and catch what was unique about the Tev protease in particular? It has some really unique things about it that make it interesting as a tool. Hopefully, what? Do you mean like, like when they were using it, like implementing it into what they were doing? Or like well, in the introduction, so in the introduction of the, of the article, they say this is protease comes from this virus and it has these unique features. Is this, um, um, it's not insensitive to protease. Say that again, it was like a double negative. It's, I, I got it, it's insensitive. Insensitive. Yeah. Or the other way to think of this would be it's resistant to protease inhibitors. That's an important one. Why would that be like, like let's think this sentence through. Why would this be a useful sort of like tool for a biotechnologist, a, a, a protease that is resistant to protease inhibitors? It won't be stopped by things that already have been Things that already what? Um, you don't have to worry about it being, I guess, um, being affected by a protease inhibitor yet. Yeah, when would you use a protease inhibitor? So you're right, it won't, it won't well, be. You don't want your protein to be good. Yes, okay, so, so good, very good. So if you're growing your Erlenmeyer flask, uh, you harvest your bacteria, and then the final, or not the final step, but one of the steps is lysis, you break everything open. That's when you've sort of like taken the cells and you've released all the proteins that are in the cell out into the like mm -hmm. soup. And when that happens, sometimes there's cellular proteases that will cleave up like the protein that you're expressing. You do not want that to happen. So oftentimes you will add to the reaction, like before you lyse, you'll put what's called a lysis buffer and that lysis buffer will have inside of it protease inhibitors. And that's for the purpose of increasing the yield of your recombinant protein. Okay, so this, vi this virus protease is unique in that it's resistant to these protease inhibitors. So there might be like a clever way to combine this with some kind of a protocol that's purifying recombinant proteins in the presence of protease inhibitors. So yes, that's, we'll get to that in a sec, like what that connection is. But um, that's one reason why it's unique. What was the other reasons? High degree of specificity. Yeah, it's specific. Um, and the, there's a bunch of words for this. Um, one word is a uh, protease recognition site. And another word for this is the consensus site. So these words commonly come up in molecular biology and biotechnology. Um, how is recognition site different from a consensus site? So, or what, what's a recognition site? Can you guys define it for me? It's the, it's the evidence. Yeah, but like, like, give me specifically, like, what when when I say site, like, what does that translate to at the molecular level? Yeah, yeah. there's a sequence of amino acids. So the sequence for this one is E N L Y F Q, and then there's this little triangle. This is direct from the from the paper, actually it's, okay, so let's decode this like recognition site. So this is a recognition site. Recognition site means it's like, that's a specific sequence of amino acids that uh, protease recognizes. So where does the cleavage happen if it sees this, this string? This is a string of amino acids. Where does the cleavage happen? Where? Yeah, right here. Okay, so that's how you like decode this information. So it's got to find this string. And then what does this mean over here that... It can be either one way. Yeah, this is like there's multiple options. In the, in the classical one, it's the serine that comes here. But there can be a few separate options. Um, so if you see any annotation that looks like this, it means... Any, it's essentially like an OR clause. Okay. So this is a recognition site. What's the consensus sequence? Did anybody find that in any of the papers? 
or re remember it or see any reference to it or know how it would be different from a recognition site? I can't remember. What? No, there's no complement to protein. Okay, so don't confuse protein and nucleic acid. There's no complement to proteins. There's only complement in nucleic acids. Are transition sequences only created from nucleic acids or can they all also do amino there's DNA, there's DNA uh, consensus sequences. So the consensus and, would just be like the most common? Um, yes, the most, so the consensus site is the recognition site expressed in sort of like the most common language. That's a good way to say it. Uh, so the actual consensus site is E, X, X, Y, X, Q. Um, SG. I think that that's that. So this is the consensus sequence. So this means that this protease, it's normally like it's best cleaving this recognition site. This is what it's looking for. But this is the consensus sequence, meaning if you have any other amino acid here besides N or L, like it's still going to cleave that. Another word for this in computer science, we call these things schemas, right? Like this is like a pattern and the X can be anything as long as you fill in these spots correctly, where you have an E, a Y, and Q, it'll cleave. So that's the difference between like a recognition site and a consensus sequence. Along with Bella's question, just like a tangent, there are consensus sequences for, for example, for genes. Like if you compare, if you compare orthologs, like gene one compared to gene one from say like chimps, you can develop these consensus sequences where certain residues are conserved and other residues are can be whatever they want. That's in the other context you see it. How is it so highly specific when there's so much variation in the consensus sequence? This is actually a, a pretty complex schema. Like there's only three that it needs to be, but it's three out of 20 and they're in very specific positions. So this is, a, I would not call this as like a broad this is actually very rigid in terms of like what it can cleave. If you saw, for example, some um, contrast this with trypsin, what's the, what's the recognition site of trypsin, which is another protease that's used in biotechnology? Does anybody know? Or can you Google it quick? You don't have to Google it, I can just tell you. It's K's and R's. So all this, all this protease does is it just finds positive residues and cuts. So this would be a very, very broad cleaver. Um, and this would be a highly specific cleaver. Okay. Okay, so that was the other thing that was like utilitarian about it, is it has this very specific, yeah, specific consensus sequence. Um, the final other thing was that it tolerates changes in pH. Why would that be useful in a biotechnology context? Um, so you don't have to be as, I guess, as worried about like the different buffers? Yes, it'd be perfect, the different buffers. As you go through the recombinant protein expression protocol, it's like a chain, and at these different steps of the chain, you're often like changing the buffer. And so a protease that can function as properly within all these different buffers would be super useful. So these are the reasons why it's unique and why it might be useful. And it has become um, a common tool that uh, we're gonna be using in our lab. And I, some of the postdocs that I worked with used to do this. Okay, so um, did anybody catch what they were doing with it, why it's useful? They were, they were using it to, so like, only they like make the purification process, I guess, smaller than what it, like the I think what was the other name of the, the one they were using before this. Let's so let's broadly say they're using it to improve a purification process. So like I would agree with that. So, I don't I don't necessarily know if it makes I think you said it makes it shorter. I don't know if it makes it shorter. They said it was like a two step. I don't know. They didn't it, say the, it was the actual protocol for the purification at the end is is shorter. Like okay. you have to, yeah, because you don't worry yeah. as much about washing it. Yeah, okay, so you're gonna improve purification processes uh, and 
I guess I would think of one of the reasons that you use this is to improve the, um, you, what do you call it, the, the purity. Mm -hmm. uh, like you'll have less contaminants if you do this process. So how are they using it? Like what were they doing? You got, so this is correct. Like, but what were they doing with it? Like I come- Okay, so we have we have a plasmid, the PGEX. I already went over this one. Talk to me about like what PGEX is or how it looks. This was actually a figure from the paper. It has a lock repressor uh, it's got for the lock. universification. Yep, keep going. And then a selectable marker for ampicillin. Okay, keep going. You have still haven't hit the main interesting thing. The tax promoter. So it does have a promoter, and I think actually this promoter is controlled somewhere upstream by the LAC operator. Okay, and then what? What? What do you? What do they have here after the promoter? A GST. This is a GST tag. Okay, so there's going to be a start code on here after the promoter. There's a GST tag. Okay, GST is glutathione S transferase. It's a protein that will bind to glutathione which we'll talk about in a second. But what do they have what what do they have after this? We still haven't even gotten to the point where like they're connecting this in. The glutathione. They have T So they have the temp site. So that was I, I erased it. It was uh, it's longer but the actual consensus is D X X Y X Q S. And it'll get cut there. So they insert this in the codons, of course, the codons of the DNA. Okay, and then what's here, right here? Um, the restriction enzyme. A multi-cloning site with some restriction enzymes, probably. Okay, so they've inserted this. Now, like, explain to me, like, why, why is that useful? Yeah. Okay, so the GST tag. So, okay, so let's just slow down. So hold your thoughts. That's good. So first, if we have a, if we have a glutathione, glutathione, glutathione is a, I think a chemical. Somebody fact check what glutathione is, but they bind it to sephiros beads. So it's sephiros coated with glutathione. You make a column and any protein that has this GST fused to it, so if you have any construct that looks like this, it's gonna produce a protein that looks like this. And if you run this over the column, this will bind, right? This is just classical affinity chromatography. It'll bind like that and you have everything bound. And then after, if you wanna get rid of all the, all the contaminants, right, you just wash it just continues through the wash. Everything washes through that doesn't bind. And then if you, when you want to elute, get the protein off in its pure form, you can just add gluta, glutathione. And the free glutathione will release the protein and then it will come off and you can collect it in the tube. Right, so that's classical affinity chromatography. So now finish your thought that whatever we clone in here is gonna have the GST. Yeah, so, okay, so in this case, let's say we clone the gene X right here. Now what the protein is gonna look like is it's gonna be X with this little cleavage site, and then it's gonna be GST. It's gonna look something like this. This is gonna bind. And then you said, if you add tab, what, what will happen? I wanna say, you will be able to release the protein. Yeah, so in this case, if you add if you add actual temp protease to this column, um, now it's gonna make that cut. And now once it's cut, X is no longer bound to the column, and so X will pass through the column and you can collect it. Okay. What did they do? Um, but how how can this be? So this is a one step. This would be a one step, and it probably does improve the purification of one steps. How would it improve? So hopefully I can erase this. Everybody's got that. 
let, let's, let's actually just compare. So in one case, we have a column, a cobalt, or a GST column. And in that case, we have GST bound to X. So let's compare minus the tab site and plus the tab site. In this case, you elute with free glutathione. In this case, you elute by adding TEV. These are both one step purifications. Why is one better than the other? But if you add free glutathione, so if you add enough free glutathione, it competes with the binding and it will, you'll be able to wash away all the bound GSTX. Why else? So, so there's actually a reason why this one is better. Try to think of like, why, why is this one might be, might be better? So, so what do you mean? So, so GST is actually like GST is actually pretty pure. Like there aren't many contaminants that bind to GST. Um, but typically, when you run a column, there's other things that can bind to these beads. Like you have when you break open cells, there's if E. coli has five thousand genes, there's five thousand proteins. Typically, some of those proteins can bind to the column. And so you do get situations naturally where say, say blue is like contaminants. You'll get contaminants that will bind to the, the GST column. And let's say, let's say X is, is red. Typically, you have like way more red bound in the column. But, but what's gonna happen now when you dilute and you add the and you add the free glutathione. You'll get red and blue. Stuff. You'll get yeah. You'll get red and blue in your in your final purification in your tube. Whereas in this case, you have the same contaminants. It's the exact same like cells that are expressing. So you have the same contaminants. Okay, but in this case, the contaminants cannot come off the column unless you add the TEP, because you're not adding a competitive inhibitor, inhibitor like the glutathione, you're adding a protease that's actually gonna cut it off. So even in a single step, like there is an improvement in terms of reducing the contaminants that come through the column. Does everybody kind of understand like why you would do that? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the one, that's like a one step. There's also actually in the paper, in the first paper, what they did is a two step. Purification. What did they, does it, can anybody describe that one? They, uh, they produced it in E. coli tissue proteins with glutathione S transfers and then. Wait, so, so you're saying they made some protein GST fused to what? Actually, I think it was, I think they actually liter, literally labeled it protein X. I think it was actually GAL4, which is interesting. We know what that is. But I think, I think in the paper they label it protein X. So they make this, and then what did they do? And they bound the glutathione uh, to the affinity column, and then they cleaved it with a recombinant histamine tag. Yeah. So, so they, so, so here's how they. So this is a two-step that I'll draw. Very good. Okay. So they have this GST protein construct, right? That's in some plasma to some promoter. They're expressing that. That gets made. They run that over the column. Okay. Now they have they have that protein bound to the column, and there is a there is a cleavage site in between. Okay, and then he said, Chris said they have a put it over here. So this is step one. Step two, they also built a his six tab. Okay, so somewhere there's a plasmid with the tab protease, and they put in a little his six tag, okay, and they make this protein, and then they put that over the column as step two, okay? And what's gonna come off the column now? What's gonna, what's gonna drip off the column? After two, you add the TEP protease. Mm 
Yeah, okay, so remember you have the GST fused to protein X. The TEV is gonna cleave. So one of the things you're gonna get is X. It's gonna be coming off. What else is gonna come off the column? Yeah, you're also gonna get the TEV because the TEV has no tag. It has a tag, it doesn't have the GST tag. So the TEV is also gonna come off, okay? And then they take this, this is the first column, and then they take this and they run it through a second column, which is what? Nickel. What? Yeah, it's nickel. So you have a nickel column. And in this case, when you take this input, what sticks and what runs through? In this case, this is tag. So now the tab is going to get stuck to the nickel beads. And any other contaminants, we'll, well, we'll, have, we'll go through that in a second. But then the, the X should just pass straight through the column. So in this case, you're running the tab to elute um, the X, but both come off. And then you're running the second column to remove the tab. So this is the two step. It's a little bit longer than the first process. Um, but we typically, if you run two columns, you're often removing more contaminants. Okay, you can get pure, more pure cultures. So there's various like schemes for this, right? Like this, depending on where you put the recognition site and what, what you put it on, etc., and what tags you mix together. But you can set up things where you can improve a single column or a double column to get better purity and yield. Okay. Um, uh, the single column, like I just added a like a GST site to this tab seven plug base. They they could have done that same process in one step. You're saying make a GST tab, and then you have a GST recognition site X. Mm -hmm. Do it like this, and then yeah, then in this case, in theory, they would not have to run the yeah the two column. But when you be yeah, but but a to a we need what? It will because the GST on there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So like that's what I mean by like there's various schemes, various ways. Um, I don't know why they settle on one in particular, but uh, typically you 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 try some, see what works best for you. Do you remember if they said they let it sit in the column when they were incubating with the tab, or if they just ran it over with the tab that it had in there? Sure. I think they were actually doing these in tubes like you do. Yeah. I don't think they actually had a column well, I think I, when I read it closely. Run it over, like the tab over the column, I don't think it would have enough time to interact with all the proteins. So I was well, I don't know about that because enzymes are like fast. But you can also like just put the pin in the bottom and then let it sit in there instead of- Yeah, I think that would be better to like incubate. Minute. Yeah, you could close the column off and then you could just like mm -hmm. incubate. Um, okay, let's see. How much time do we have left? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Um, we might come back to that. Let's go to the, the second paper, okay. So do we, does everybody kind of understand like why at least the tab would be useful like in biotechnology? Okay, so what's the, what's the point of the second paper, which was the Doudna paper? That it created a mutant, a mutant in a probe that reduced the um, the auto, um, so, so, so there were, so after people started using TEV, like I, I'm not an expert on the history of TEV, but according to these two papers, like essentially people, TEV became very popular uh, and people started noticing some things about it. So one of the things, one of the downsides, so this would be a cons, one of the cons you said was what again? Um, the auto proteins feature, I mean the auto feature. Yeah, was the self cleavage. So, in the natural context, have protease has some kind of self-cleaving activity, which I, I can't remember if it activates or deactivates or lowers the activity, but it's got some autocatalytic, another word for that is autocatalytic activity where it cleaves itself. So in the data for that actual paper, how, how, could, how did they show you that that was happening? Do you, do you remember? So in the actual, yeah, okay, so they had an SDS page gel. There was some SES phase gel. How did they determine that it was cleaving itself? So, like in a different lens, the 
Okay. Don't don't tell me the different lanes. Just tell me like what was the very specific result that they saw. They noticed that the veins. They what? They noticed that the veins were like um were cleaved it were before they had added the first X. Like he cleaved the cell. Like they had to notice that. You're not describing it well though. I'm sorry. I'm trying like to I think I know you're right. Like, I, no, I know you're I know you understand, but like you have to explain it in better words. Like so I have we have one band. Well okay. if that band cleaved itself it would be two bands. Yes. Good, so, so somewhere in these figures, like there's a figure where you see this, okay. And you said they were able to inactivate that activity. How did they do that? I guess they targeted the specific, oh, they changed the speed for color. Um, so, they, so they did a mutation. Mm -hmm. So you can see why being able to do a quick change would be useful. So they did a mutation, what was the mutation? Um, serine to Torque. It was S, was it 119 or what's the number? Oh, it was um, A219. 219. So it was S219N, so they changed the serine to an N. Where was this serine? What, what was serine? So if this is TEV, if this is the sequence of TEV, 219 somewhere here, uh, but what was it about that serine that was unique? I don't, want to, I don't want to look up the actual site. But actually, the really interesting thing about that, if you read the discussion closely, the TEF protease, it doesn't actually have the consensus sequence. It's got like a weird site. It's got some weird site that actually doesn't fit the consensus sequence, but there is like this last serine, which is the serine, that's the 219. That's the S219. And for some reason, the TEF protease can like fold on itself and recognize that serine and it cuts up that serine. So that's the serine that they mutated. How they knew it was that serine, I don't know. Maybe somebody identified that earlier. But so they mutate that serine, which was the recognition site inside of the actual TEV gene. They mutate, mutate that to uh, an N. And then how did the data change? Just tell me, don't even look. Like how would the data change? Which one? This one or this one? If, if it looked like this, what would that tell you? Rachel. If, if, that, if the data looked like that in the mutant, what would that, what would that tell you? It's crystal powder. Yes, that means it's cleaving more. Oh, so if, if it did that, if it converted from that to that, you're like, wow, I made it even better at cleaving itself. I'm thinking about it exactly. Yeah, so tell me the better way. The top one. Yeah, so the data looked like that which means that you're inhibiting the self-cleavage of itself, which is not producing that band anymore. That's how you're actually able to like tell that they did that. Okay, so that was one of the cons of TEF protease that they sort of like try to fix. What, what else did they try to fix? Or what, what else did they know what was the purpose? They wanted a more efficient, um, they wanted to produce larger quantities of... Um, they wanted a better yield, yes. What was the problem with the original yield? They resulted in the inclusion body. Yeah, okay, so what's an inclusion body? It's what? not soluble. Yeah, inc inclusion bodies are just like aggregates. That's an actual term, aggregates. Aggregates are when proteins precipitate and they bind to other precipitated proteins and you just get these clumps. Okay, those are inclusion bodies. So if you express something that's insoluble, so that's the actual way to phrase the problem, is they were not getting a good yield because it was insoluble. And it's just forming these inclusion bodies. And so if you try to do like a nickel pull down or something like that, nickel pull downs rely on running liquid over the column, which means anything that's precipitating, is that's not gonna work in that process. So. I think they say something like 90% of the protein was in the insoluble fraction, which is the inclusion bodies. If it's not soluble, so you can't run it through a column. Um, or if you do run it through the column, you only get a 10% yield. So then they developed like a whole new purification protocol to, pro uh, to purify the protein from the inclusion bodies, which involved like a denaturing process. And then they renatured, which means like, if this is the protein, just in case people don't understand, denaturing would mean to like, remove its folding pattern into the primary structure, and then renaturing it would be putting it in a new buffer where it can come back to its original conformation. 
um, and that worked and they compared, they compared the yields and the activities. So they got a much better yield. Um, but did anybody actually look at the, did you look at this, this cleavage data? So when you, when they compared it to, so this is, this is, I can't remember what figure this is, but this is lanes three, four, and five. And I think this is an SDS page. And in lanes three, four, five, you see a pattern that looks like this. So you see a pattern that looks like this. What was lane three? Uh, and oh wait, so wait, first, first, what are, what are these bands? What is this that they were testing? That's up here. That's what they're changing. That's what they're changing. So here, these three, four, and five, these are different, oh, different types of TEF protease. But that doesn't answer my question of what, what was this? What was this that they were looking at, actually? What is this Where protein? Is what? The, oh, protein? What is this protein? That is not TEV. It's not TEV. Anybody else? Did you look and try to interpret the data? <laughs> is it the XA? It's not the, I think the XA is an enzyme. It's not an XA enzyme. Like, what are they looking at when these bands change? What's happening? Like how much was cleaved? Cleaved of what though? That's the important thing. So in the first gel, what we looked at, something was changing. That was the actual TEV protease cleaving itself. That's the one we talked about. In this oh, gel, you're not saying the right word. It is it is some protein that so. It's just a protein that has the recognition sites. Yes, yes, that's the key thing. This is what you call a substrate. This is just some some protein X. I don't want to say X, but some protein Z because I already use X. Some protein Z that has the recognition site. And if it's not cut, it's bigger. And if it is cut, it's smaller. And so by seeing how much you see of either uncut versus cut, that's a measure of the activity of the enzyme. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so they have the same substrate, but they're changing the different types of enzyme. And what was three? What was the control? No, this was this was plus step because it's all cleaved. So it just has either side. So yeah, well, well, wait, say that again. Okay. So in lane three, that's the, if you look at this figure, that's this, that's this. This was giving a hundred percent cleavage of that substrate. What was that enzyme? Nine, eight, nine. Yeah, that was a TEV protease that it was NIA pro. That was a TEV protease that they bought, I think, which was his six nickel purified. So they bought this one and, and that's the activity they got. Okay, and then what was four? Um, four was the wild type TEV. Okay, and it looked essentially like this, what was, which means that it's cleaving most of the substrate, but not all. What was lane five? The actual like the thing they determined like the serine to that was the mutant that was the mutant tab. So I, I think it's what is it? It's a T P S N. I don't know their label for it yet. It is a mutant. It was the S219 N tab. And it's essentially like the same. It's essentially like the same activity. It's a little bit better. I think if you look at the band real closely, it's kind of like a little bit weaker, so it's a little bit better. But one of their arguments in the beginning of the paper was that this is a very important issue that is cleaving itself because uh, it might be like lowering the activity of your enzyme. And when they actually did the experiment, like whatever they wrote in the discussion, it doesn't seem like it was like inhibiting the activity that much. And the funniest thing is when they were arguing that the, um, the purification thing that they developed, they got a better yield but the one that was kept soluble the whole time was actually the better like activity. So it was like, like you can see how sort of like compromising the, uh, the protocol might give you a better yield, but it might not necessarily give you the best enzyme. And doing it entirely in nickel, if it only gives you 10%, that might be enough 
and it might be enough of a much better activity enzyme. And so you might actually rather have the 10% yield than the 90% yield if the 90% yield is of lower enzymatic quality. So it's kind of like, <laughs> it's just like an interesting thing. Um, you always want in the lab, I feel like you always want to do like what works for you best. And so like you might compare and you might say, well, which one of these is the better protocol? I'm curious what you think, because you actually have to prep Tev. So like, what, 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 what's your process or what's your protocol? Not this at all. Their buffers are different. Like, okay. I mean, almost every single step is different except for the temperature and then they induce at point and six these, OD instead of point seven and they use yeah. the same media. But and these are 20 years from now? Like yeah. these papers are 20 years old? So like, I'm sure like how they do it now is a little bit different. But okay. Control, the only thing that he warned yeah. me about was um, it's insolubility, but he, all of that- So he said be, the same thing? Yeah, but all of it can be adjusted with like simple salt concentration changes. I see, so they kind of work, have worked out like a better protocol yeah, to be more soluble. But that's through a process, so, so the way that people would figure that out is that's through a process of many people purifying tab and trying to like change the protocol, figure out what's the best way. And so that's what Duna was trying to do back then is like figure out, okay, what's a better way to purify this, et cetera. So that was the context of the papers. Uh, any questions or problems? The, she, is this, she's the one that- um, Won the Nobel Prize for CRISPR? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Jeez. Oh, okay. That's actually that's actually a really interesting question. So, so Jennifer Dudna is a structural biologist. What does that mean? What's a structural biologist? It would be similar to like really? Does your Wait, okay, similar to what? Structural, <laughs> I don't know. structural. What do you think of when you think of structural biology? I would think about it. Sure, cells and stuff. Oh. Yeah, the structures of like cells. So, so have you guys ever done YouTube and you watch like some complicated like protein and it's like a machine and there's pieces that like move? Have you ever seen that? Like you can you never? Okay, you gotta like, you have to start like YouTubing proteins. Apparently like not everybody is as interested as like watching protein uh, machine. But like there's actually like complicated movies of so like imagine trying to figure out like if you could see the ribosome at like a microscopic level and see like how it's moving, like you could see how that would be useful, right? So so there's a question of how do they actually, when you see those videos, how do they have data to know that that's the real way it moves? Have you ever like wondered that? Yeah. How do you think they do it? So some of those movies are actually like accurate. Like we know exactly how the machine moves. And the way that you know how the machine moves is through structural biologists. So does anybody know the first video that was ever made? So the first video that was ever made, like old school, was the, have you seen the video of the black and white horse, the horse running? That's the first video that was ever made. And what that is, is that's a series of essentially like super fast, like still shots of like, let's say this is one, time point one, two, three, four, five. So they just got a really fast camera. Probably they had like some crank and it was like machine gunning like uh, pictures. And every one of these is a picture. And if you detect like changes in each frame, that's, that's how you know it moves. So that's how they figured out the sh movement of how the horses move. And then essentially like at the protein level, this is what structural biologists do. So they hire, they do like crystallography, so it's X-ray, X-ray crystallography or like cryo-EM is a new one. These are like complicated ways to get pictures of actual like proteins with some mathematics and some algorithms and stuff. And so you hire like one PhD to like, okay, in this context, let's get a crystal structure of the protein. You can imagine like if you're trying to get the ribosome, like let's try to get a structure of the ribosome by itself. Like maybe that's still shot one. And then maybe the next thing is let's try to get the structure of a ribosome bound to RNA. So then you compare the by itself to the structure bound to RNA and you can see like how it's changed. And then maybe you'd get one of ribosome plus tRNA. So like when it's ready to like load uh, 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 an amino acid, you get a crystal structure of that. So every one of these is like somebody's like five, 10 year like PhD thesis. And then once you've done enough of them, you can string together like a movie. That's actually where those movies come from. 
And so, so anyway, back to Jennifer Dudna. She's a structural biologist. She studies proteins, their shapes, their structures, and how the structures actually impact like function. And so if you were a structural biologist, why would this technique be useful? Like if you're gonna be taking snapshots of proteins through crystallography or cryo -EM, do you need a lot of the protein or a little of the protein? So essentially like the entire like workflow of structural biologists is just constant recombinant protein expression and constantly like adapting better ways to get more protein yield so that they can take pictures of the protein. And so people like that are very interested in any sort of technique that can improve the yield or purity of the protein because it helps them get the better pictures. So that's why that's useful. Make sense? Okay, happy Friday. <laughs>